class. Hi, this is Dr. Palmer here, and this is our AP lecture on public opinion. Um, let's begin. Man is a, a political animal, and by his very nature, anytime he gets together with somebody, uh, he's going to exhibit both social and political aspects. Thomas Hobbes argued that whenever we form a civil society to avoid fear and uncertainty, uh, we are exhibiting the, this political nature of man. And um, the, uh, the fact that we live in a civil society in close proximity to everyone else inevitably leads us to demand order and social structure while maintaining the notion of freedom. Uh, and this is kind of exemplified by the fact that when you go to a place like New York City, there are some unwritten but definite social rules that occur when you are, say, going in the subway, because we're in close proximity to each other uh, and certain uh, norms are exhibited. So, we are a political animal, and um, what is the psychology of freedom? Do we have this need to be free? Do we have a psychological need to be free? And um, if so, where does it come from? Is, is freedom an internal drive, like hunger or thirst? Or is it kind of an external need? Maslow's hierarchy of needs attempts to model human motivation. And uh, you can picture a triangle. Um, you know, like here, let's try to draw one here for you. Sorry, we're going to go back here a little bit. All right, well, I guess I'm not going to be able to draw a triangle, but just imagine a triangle. Um, and the, the triangle is going to represent uh, the order in which you have to have things done in your life. At the bottom of the triangle, you have physiological needs, such as food, water, warmth, rest. Above that is, is safety. Once you've achieved your your immediate survival goals, then safety becomes your next your next goal. Um, and then uh, way up at the top, uh, we have a need of self-actualization, including achieving your full potential and creative activities and things like that. Um, it's kind of like the idea that when, when you're in class, you find it extremely hard, almost impossible to concentrate if you're hungry or if you're tired. These are immediate physical uh, needs that you have and uh, it doesn't matter how much you try to concentrate uh, you're not going to be able to uh, you know meet your full potential there and that's that's what um, uh, that's what Maslow is trying to say to us so uh, we assume then that the the need for uh, freedom and control are way up at the ho top of those um, at the hierarchy of needs so we can um, understand that unless your physiological and safety needs uh, are being met then you're not going to be able to move up into those higher things uh, such as the idea of do I have an internal drive to have freedom and Eric Fromm also thought about this and he wrote in Escape from Freedom in 1941 um, that that a, a psychological conflict exists between our need for freedom and for order. And the history of man has been one from advancement from, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from basic needs to individual freedoms. For example, in the Middle Age uh, of, uh, of history, you're born into your life, nothing would change your circumstances and your life is pretty much predetermined based on where you were born uh, in the the social order the Protestant Reformation freed, freed man from this sort of a religious destiny and from this preordained path that was dictated by God the Industrial Revolution freed man economically uh, from this communal agrarian society and then as we move on the democratic revolutions brought into existence this belief in self-government but with freedom comes responsibility for oneself and for others in society as well um, and our, our, our fear of freedom 
and responsibility forces us to attempt to, in, in fact, escape from, from freedom. And we do this by submitting to the authoritarian systems, by becoming passive and compliant, and allowing others to dictate our, our actions. And this, this authority gives us security and stability. Um, and this, uh, this sort of counterintuitive uh, idea makes a little sense when you start looking at some of the examples where we, 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 we have this sort of uh, gravitation towards totalitarian states. We profess to have a desire for freedom, and yet we always tend to want to move towards somebody telling us what to do. The Germans uh, did this during World War II to, to alleviate the pressures of the Versailles Treaty and the, great, the, the depressions that they were under uh, through the 1930s. Uh, they, they turned to Hitler and his final solutions. Um, in Afghanistan, the Taliban carries out um, the ultra-strict interpretation of the Muslim faith without any real opposition. Um, uh, as you can probably guess, uh, life can be very desperate in Afghanistan. Um, and even, you know, within our own, uh, our own ways, we tend to, in times of crisis uh, particularly, um, we tend to, to move towards having a strong uh, executive to, to make decisions for us. Another person who thought about the psychology of freedom versus order uh, was B.F. Skinner. And B.F. Skinner uh, kind of takes it to the next level, really, when he suggests that free will and self-determination and individual choice are really just illusions. That um, behavior is not a conscious choice, but is really controlled by the environment. Um, and um, if you can control the environment, you can control people's behaviors. So Skinner's approach contradicts what we have ingrained as our belief that behavior arises and is caused within the person. It is an external forces on us, not our internal motivations. And it's a little unsettling, wouldn't you say, to think that uh, there, it's the circumstances of life that are, that are moving you and not your own internal fortitude. Well, you know, for example, if you follow uh, B.F. Skinner's rationale, um, crime is not a product of individual choice, but a product of the environment on the, on the individual. From birth to death, society shapes and determines behavior through our, our uh, system of punishments and rewards, sometimes overt, sometimes very subtle. And crit now, critics believe that Skinner was advocating a totalitarian state that controlled human behavior just as Skinner was controlling the behavior of rats in his famous uh, Skinner box experiment. But uh, Skinner noted that human behavior is, is already the product of various authorities, such as parents, teachers, politicians, uh, religious leaders, e employers. So, uh, at any, you know, from whatever perspective you take here, it's a very interesting thought about um, this idea of freedom versus order, and is of course very basic to our understanding of government and our, and our ability to try to predict uh, um, what society is going to do and, and, and how uh, political decisions are made. So let's look at America specifically. America's struggle between this idea of liberty uh, and equality versus our, our need for order, and if you're to believe uh, folks like uh, Eric Fromm and, and B.F. Skinner, you know, we have this tendency towards authoritarian um, uh, wanting, to be, wanting to be told what to do. <clears throat> so, um, we have a stated value, um, a core value of our country, that we believe in liberty and we believe in equality. And the values of liberty and equality in the United States are probably more widespread than, than elsewhere because America is always viewed as sort of the land of opportunity. Um, in the, the, uh, if you look at other countries, if you look at the feudal system that dominated Europe, um, they created class divisions and economic conflict. A societal system of inequality that was largely accepted by the population. And in our country, uh, we've had no socialist movement because our prosperity and the expansion of political rights made the workers' revolution uh, at least diluted, if not uh, completely unnecessary. 
and as well our education system reinforces these values of liberty and equality so yes indeed we do have core values of liberty and equality but we also struggle with the quest for our, um, these freedoms versus our need for order and it's clear that, uh, that Americans are, are divided with regard to this uh, we're divided on what is the proper role of government in American society and what is the proper role of religion and moral values in our, in our public life we see this conflict in the laws that are being enacted that gives the government more authority over our daily lives like the Patriot Act and even just in our school dress codes you know uh, should we have uniforms in schools should we just let people do whatever they want there's pros and cons but they are all within this idea of uh, freedom versus order so um, applying the core values uh, while we share a common set of core values, there is, there is conflict as to how we actually apply those in certain areas. So liberty may be our most cherished value. Uh, we believe that governmental interference should be kept to a minimum, uh, but yet we look to the government to impose moral standards on society. So that's kind of a, um, a dichotomy here. It's, a, it's kind of a contradiction. Uh, Americans support the idea of free speech, but we do have a long history of silencing unpopular speech. Just take a look at some of the examples of history. Communism in the 1950s, um, anti-war speech in the 1960s and 1970s, the push for political correctness on college campuses. You can't say whatever you want anymore. Um, and, you know, even um, uh, unpopular speech, which should be protected, is, is being blocked, such as uh, Nazi marches in uh, Skokiegi, Illinois, were blocked by the city council. Um, of course, that was later overturned by the federal courts. But here you see that, you know, if we if we believe in if we supposedly believe in free speech, uh, we're having some problems in its actual application. And um, the idea of equality. Now, equality is valued uh, if properly defined. Equality under law is an accepted value. Um, everybody's going to be treated the same under law. Um, but is that, can we actually say that? Well, you know, say that on paper, but let's take a look at issues such as racial profiling. Um, let's look at an issues of, like, the death penalty. Um, women are largely not uh, executed in those states that do. Uh, is, is, is that a sexist sort of... Um, 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 idea and, and African Americans are overwhelmingly executed more than any other race. So um, we also have this idea of political equality, also an accepted value. But also note that we have widespread disenfranchisement of voters um, and overt attempts, in some cases, by political parties to keep certain segments of the population from getting to the polls. In this last election, 2000. Um, 2012, we saw um, concerted efforts by um, uh, by the heads of the, uh, this, this, the secretaries of states in certain states that were trying to um, make it um, more favorable for certain parties to get to the polls. And of course, the the power of money in politics. You know, we talk about political equality. Um, you have to you have to admit that money. Uh, is driving the political machine and those with money have much uh, more political clout than people without. Um, another aspect of equality that we've, we cherish or, or at least kind of give a nod to um, is economic equality and, and, and of course that's got to be carefully defined. Um, equality of opportunity is widely accepted and has a lot of support and um, uh, but but versus equality of results now that uh, that's associated with socialism and because we don't guarantee you that you're going to be rich when you come to this country but we are supposed to guarantee you an equality of opportunity now if you're thinking hard about this you're going to understand that equality of opportunity uh, is probably a misnomer as far as uh, economic equality goes does uh, somebody born into money uh, makes millions of dollars uh, is that uh, is that equ equal to somebody starting with nothing and making a million dollars um, I I would submit to you that 
somebody like um, Mitt Romney, who was uh, um, you know born into money, uh, would have an easier time of making millions of dollars than somebody who was born in the um, the ghettos of Chicago, say. So <clears throat> we have a lot of conflicts, don't we? And and you know, sort of. <sighs> Are we chasing treadmills like Don Quixote, striving for something that we can never achieve because biologically or psychologically we're actually incapable of attaining those levels of behavior, these aspirations? Well, you know, we leave that, we leave that up to, uh, you know, kind of philosophy a little bit, but these, if these are untruths, that we have equality, that we have liberty, uh, at least they're comforting truths. Political participation and public opinion. What we do and why we do it. If we are to govern ourselves, we have to first understand why we behave the way we do. And over the last 50 years, social scientists, uh, that includes sociologists, political scientists, psychologists, historians, they've uh, attempted to better understand why we behave in the manner that we do. They've conducted experiments, they've observed, they've probed. They've analyzed public polls, and, and finally, um, we have crunched numbers. We have examined biological and psychological behavior and compared one to another as uh, we compare our ancestors, we compare ourselves to other species. And we probably know a bit more now than we did in the 1950s, uh, and our predictions are certainly better, but why we do the things we do is still largely a mystery. We have some insight into what we do in certain situations. We are still not sure why we do the things we do. So, in trying to predict, uh, have a so sort of measurable prediction of attitudes, um, we attempt to do this by predicting, uh, that is to say, predicting political behavior. We attempt to do this by measuring an individual's attitudes on issues. Uh, such as events and personalities. Um, for example, an individual might vote in an election uh, and it may be predicted uh, how he would vote by asking questions measuring his attitudes towards two different candidates. For example, um, if the election were held tomorrow, would you be more likely to vote for candidate A or candidate B? Um, so uh, we, by this we can, we can figure out or try to, try to surmise uh, what's going to happen in the future. Let's do some basic definitions here. Attitudes. Attitudes are a product of the beliefs and values that one acquires throughout life and, and, um, and represent a specific preference to a particular subject. Um, beliefs are those things we think to be true or false. Um, we should add another one in here. We should add also values. Values are those things that we think to be good or bad. What are your values? What do you think is good? What do you think is bad? Um, and and um, selective perception is a process by which we accept or believe uh, only those things that are consistent with our value and our belief system. Ascertaining the attitudes of a single individual um, Although interesting, will not allow us to predict the outcome of an election. Uh, and for that, we have to measure public opinion. We have to get a wider, much wider sampling than just the individual. So we look to public opinion. So what is that? Public opinion is the attitudes that people have about issues, events, and personalities. And political ideology is a cohesive set of values and beliefs that form a general philosophy about the role of government. And for political ideology, um, Americans tend to think about, uh, about ideology in terms of liberal versus conservative. These terms uh, are labels attached to political ideologies regarding the proper role of government in our lives. Liberal is used, to, is used generally to describe individual, individuals that support political and social reform. Um, they also liberals also believe in government intervention in the economy. Uh, liberals believe in the expansion of social services and the protection of the poor, minorities, women, consumers, the environment. And uh, contrawise, the conservatives 
Uh, and the term conservative is used to describe individuals who support traditional roles of limited government in, in the economy. But <clears throat> um, they, don't, they aren't just generally looking at limited government. They want limited government only in the economy. They uh, want more government involvement and stronger intervention in maintaining moral standards and providing for national defense. We'll keep on this page. So, <clears throat> political socialization. Political socialization. This is the formation of your political attitudes. Political socialization is the induction of an individual into the political culture. We do this through learning un underlying beliefs and values that the political system is based on. And we have agents of social, uh, or excuse me, of political socialization. These are uh, aspects of life that influence us in developing our own um, political ideology. The first and the foremost, first and foremost, is the family. We acquire our initial orientation towards politics from our family, from your parents or whoever brought you up. Differences in family background will affect political values, but children absorb in information and they do this by listening to parents, by discussing social issues with them, or just simply observing their parents' behavior. Research has found that party preferences are, are formed at home, and if you ask yourself, uh, if you're a young person, what your political affiliation is, most of the time it will be in line with uh, your general family's um, political affiliation. So um, this, this party identification is imitated as early as the third grade. And when the two parents agree on partisanship, studies show that 76% 76, 76 of adolescents follow the preferences of their parents. Uh, this, uh, this is not true, though, when parents disagree. In the case of, you know, say you have a, a Democrat and, and a Republican, each for a parent, then the child is more likely to adopt the mother's partisanship or they're likely to become an independent. Interesting. Um, in the family also, discipline may contribute to, to, um, um, to the idea of authoritarian values. If corporal punishment or spanking uh, is given, uh, you, uh, studies show that you are more likely to have authoritarian values. And this this idea is sort of enforced by the fact when you think about it, uh, family operations, at least for kids, are rarely democratic. Instead, you know, the dominant parent imposes rules, and of course, with the order that must be followed, and thereby uh, they are enforcing and stressing obedience. Okay, social groups. Social groups are another agent of political socialization. Social groups include uh, those groups to which individuals belong either voluntarily or involuntarily, such as uh, involuntarily would be peer groups, educational occupational groups, interest groups, political parties, and involuntary, um, your race, your gender. Some social groups have uh, both voluntary and involuntary attributes. For example, um, your social class is involuntary, except that you can move up or down in that mobility. Um, your religion is often involuntary, but you can change your faiths. Group membership can give an individual important uh, experiences and perspectives that will shape their political and social life. Social groups also tend to educate their members through rallies, meetings, and literature. Individuals who join social groups voluntarily such as the National Organization of Women or the NAACP, will generally have stronger opinions than individuals who don't join organizations. So we can use group identity to predict political behavior, which, you know, for example, voting, due to the differences in the underlying beliefs and values um, that are presented. Um, before age, let's talk about race. Now, race is an involuntary social group that you're, you're put into. And surveys generally ask respondents to identify their race as distinct differences in attitudes can be measured by the race variable. And um, 
again, we're sort of unsettled by that, but it is it is a fact that race uh, tends to have an effect on um, your political beliefs. The most profound political divisions you're going to find are between blacks and whites. Hispanics and Asians don't exhibit the kind of distinctive political opinions that characterize the kind of conflict that exists between the blacks, blacks and whites um, politically. Now, African Americans are generally more likely to support government programs designed to promote equality. Um, for example, desegregation and affirmative action. In a 1997 Gallup poll sur uh, survey, 59% of blacks believe that government should make every effort to improve conditions for blacks and minorities. And in the same survey, 59% of whites believe that the government should not make any special effort, but that minorities should help themselves. 53% of blacks supported an increase in the affirmative action programs, compared to only 22% of whites. African Americans are also more likely to believe that discrimination still exists. Um, and African Americans show less support for the death penalty. African Americans show less support for U.S. intervention in conflicts such as Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And a significant number of African Americans consider themselves strongly conservative on issues like abortion, homosexuality, and school prayer. Um, African Americans have been more likely to vote for the Democratic Party candidates since the 1960s. Um, which is um, a, a reversal, actually, from, uh, uh, from previous uh, times. After the Civil War, African Americans supported the Republican Party because it was the party of Lincoln and emancipation. But there was, a, there was a, a minor shift in the 1930s towards the Democratic Party and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, but it was the 1960s when things really changed. In 1964, presidential elections solidified black support for the Democratic Party. Uh, as, as Johnson had pro-civil rights position compared to Goldwater uh, was states rights supporter and opposed civil rights measures in Congress. Okay, so that's, um, that's race. Now age. Generally, older Americans are more conservative on social issues like prayer in school, uh, homosexuality, and same-sex marriage. According to a Gallup polling, 58% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 support gay marriage, compared to 23% of those over 65. However, those over 65 with college degrees were three times more likely to support gay marriage than their less educated counterparts. Hmm, interesting. Um, so, religion. Um, <clears throat> A Gallup poll done uh, in 2004, uh, a little dated now, but um, still kind of instructive, asked uh, a sampling of people what, uh, what their religion was. 50% say they were Protestant, 25% Catholic, 10% other Christian, 5% non-Christian, and 9% no religious preference. Um, and evangelicals are more conservative and now are among the most loyal of the Republican voters. We've got the Christian uh, Coalition and the Moral Majority. Um, Catholics and Jews are more likely to vote Democrat, but this may be changing as Catholics uh, are looking at the abortion issue and family values and the, the, the morality, and that, that issue comes to the, to the front more. Another agent of political socialization uh, within the group of, of social groups, um, and again this is obviously um, involuntary, is uh, gender. The term gender gap refers to the difference in political opinions of men and women in, on taken on the whole. On issues um, such as abortion uh, or equality, there's really um, no uh, significant um, gender gap on those issues. But the gender gap widens on more significant issues that for, um, of force where men oppose gun control but favor the death penalty. Um, also, also significant on issues, uh, the, the gender gap is significant on issues of compassion, where women favor protection of the poor, children, and the elderly, uh, as well as support programs protecting the environment, well, much more than men do. Women also tend to align with the Democratic Party, and men tend to align with the Republican Party. 
income or social class. Again, this is one of those uh, social group things that um, you're generally born into but can change over time. So it's both voluntary and involuntary uh, in some respects. So um, it may come as no surprise that the poor generally are supportive of social welfare programs. Um, and, uh, but on non-economic domestic issues, the poor support liberal values for increased ed education, um, which they you know, feel will lead to increased income. On foreign policy issues, um, low-income individuals tend to be more isolationist as compared to upper income um, who are looking at to be more internationalists. Beginning in the 1930s, poor and working class generally aligned with the Democratic Party, while the more affluent aligned with the Republican Party. Republicans have used race as a, as a wedge issue since the 1960s to split off the working class whites from the Democratic Party. But Clinton uh, in 1992 recaptured some of the southern white vote, um, but the Democratic Party did not fare as well in 1996 and 2000 and 2004, but now we are seeing a resurgence um, and we see the, um, the, the rallies, the, the Occupy Wall Street 99% rallies and a resurgence in the Democratic Party um, with the election of Barack Obama. Region, region of the country. Early regional, uh, early regional differences um, are important. Uh, we got north versus south, east versus west. Uh, regional differences are shifting probably due to the movement of population and attention by the media. The east is only slightly more liberal than other regions, uh, despite what a lot of people think. Um, the south is considered servative, uh, conservative on social issues, but rather liberal on economic issues. The West is decidedly more liberal than the South on social issues, but tends to be conservative on economic issues. And again, all these are generalities. The Midwest is mixed, more liberal than the South, but more conservative than the West. The South becoming more Republican since 1964, and presidential election there in which Barry Goldwater the, was the anti-civil rights candidate had a big impact on that. Today, those under 30 in the South are more Republican than Democrat in their party leanings. Another agent of political socialization, and this is now beyond the, we're not out of the social group idea, is the amount of education that you have. Governments always around the world have used education to promote a common set of civic values. And schools are believed to be the instrument and the agent of political training of young people. We, see, we saw this in 1917. USSR actually removed children from families and sent them off to camps for re-education. Hitler did this and he used schools to indoctrinate school children to support him and, um, and, and the war effort. And, uh, and then the Allies did the same thing to these German kids. They, they took them off to schools to denazify them uh, after World War II. In the U.S., you are in this indoctrination. You are in this program uh, of political socialization. And it's a, it's, we're, not even trying to, we're not even trying to hide it. <laughs> you are definitely being um, indoctrinated into our political system. And we actually spend more time in, politically, in political education of our children than the USSR did. Think about it. From the very first day that you walk into school in kindergarten, you are um, inundated with national symbols and patriotism. Uh, you are taught to stress the values of liberty, equality, democracy. We put on mock elections for the president and we have student council elections and you are put through a battery of civil um, or civics courses. The culmination again is, of it is this very course you're in right now. And um, you know we again going back to that idea of that uh, tension or the the, the conflict we have between ideals and, and what we put in practice, here's a great example in our schools. We, uh, we verbally stress freedom, but if you look at the way we run schools, the way we indoctrinate you, school influence is actually more authoritarian. Um, we use authoritarian discipline. 
and order and you have to stand in straight lines and, and you watch you look at the little kids uh in kindergarten and they're 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 you know they're all in straight lines and they have to follow the leader and um so certainly that is not uh is not stressing uh individual choice and freedom um so as a result kindergarten through the 12th grade really does fail to instill uh our support for democratic values in actual practice we give you a, a bunch of verbiage on it, but we don't actually um, um, follow through that in, in the actual things we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So this might account for the fact, this sort of emphasis on authoritarian discipline and order, this might account for the fact that 60% of high school students favor police and other groups censoring books and movies. They're used to that. That's what they've been indoctrinated into. Um, and... It, it, even though we're supposed to politically socialize you, the majority of students have real significant gaps in their knowledge of our United States political system. It's really quite distressing as um, a 12th grade teacher uh, how little students know about our, our governmental system at this point. Okay, so individuals with college educations, though, are generally more supportive of democratic values, uh, more likely to participate in politics than those with just a high school diploma or not even that okay another agent of political socialization is political conditions and history where, where you are in, in uh, fixed in time and place events happening to you um, influence your political socialization during, particularly during the maturization process of, of, of school and as you become an adult and begin to have your own ideas, what happened to you, or what happened to society in that time frame is going to definitely color your, um, your ultimate uh, maturity as a political animal. So, for example, those who grew up in the, during the Depression, no matter what was going on for school or family, um, they tend to have a fear uh, about having nothing. So they tend to save it, save a lot more. That's that's a, an event that happened to them. It's affecting their you know their behaviors. Uh, those who grew up during the 1960s view every conflict as a as another potential Vietnam. These are examples. We going to probably have the same thing uh, with 9/11. You know, you grew up in the events of 9/11 and in the world of um, the uh, the terrorism um, epic. Epoch, excuse me. So that's going to shape your political socialization. All governments attempt to shape, overtly try to attempt to shape your 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 political maturization, to your, your development. They try to to influence your beliefs about the the regime in power the social and economic structure that's in place, and the political process in general. They do this by attempting to provide you with positive feelings by creating a, a national ethos. And we call this nationalism. Nationalism is the belief that people who occupy the same territory have something important in common that makes them separate and superior to others. Taken to an extreme, this uh, term turns into jingoism. But the um, the idea of nationalism is based on myths myths about the origin and history of the people their exploits their sufferings their heroes John Henry and uh, George Washington and uh, um, you know the legends um, their missions um, Huck Finn all these things here things that um, if they did exist uh, didn't exist at all the way they have been um, told to you to, to try to get your attitudes changed about uh, how our country is exceptional it's separate it's superior Nazi Germany did the same thing um, it's a nationalism gone extreme but nonetheless they use uh, symbols such as the Valkyrie and, and uh, Teutonic sort of symbols to rally the people around um, the swastika as an example you know rally them around these these symbols about things about the the German society that weren't at all true so all countries do this okay let's move on and let's look at measuring public opinion why do we measure public opinion George Gallup believed that public opinion polls 
could make us have a truer democracy. Um, he believed that polling was the equivalent of the old New England town meetings where we could um, make sure that everybody has a, a voice and, and uh, direct us towards more direct democracy. Polls can accurately measure the will of the people and uh, this is uh, what George uh, Gallup believed. He believed that public officials can turn to the latest polls to obtain the will of the citizens and therefore carry out uh, his wishes. This is sort of lofty ideals. And it's true. Today, politicians make use of public opinion polls on a, a daily basis as they decide what issues to support and what themes to adopt in, in the campaigns. But the, the, the value of that has to do with the value of the data contained in it. If, if politicians are making their decisions based on these polls, we need to make sure that these polls are accurately reflecting the will of the people. So today politicians make use of these these polls, um, but also other organizations do. Polling companies, for example, the, the Gallup organization that was started by um, George Gallup, they, they, they make money off of producing these, these polls and, and sometimes they make the data available to the public. Uh, the media, of course, use these. CNN, Fox, ABC, all of them uh, use them quite liberally to um, to highlight issues and, and to and analyze um, certain news stories that are going on. Uh, interest groups and political parties use them like the AARP, the Republican National uh, Com Committee. Different uh, aspects of decision making are determined through in part um, what polls tell them. So how do you construct a public opinion uh, or how do you uh, understand public opinion from these kinds of surveys? Well, the first thing you have to do is, and the first thing you have to understand is, we can't ask every single American. It's just cost prohibitive to do that. So you have to take a random sample of, of uh, the population to be polled. Um, and you have to get all registered voters in there. If, if politics are what you're interested in, you have to get all the registered voters, all Hispanics or all Republicans. The sampling sizes generally, by the way, are uh, range from anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500. So the, the, the idea is you have to have a sample that is representative of the general pro, uh, population. There are some challenges and common sample problems that, uh, that immediately arise. These have to do with oversampling or undersampling certain demographic groups. Um, you might oversample whites, for, for example, and not get the, uh, the full electorate in there. You might um, go to a neighborhood that is affluent, and so you're not getting, uh, as you take these polls, and you're not getting accurate uh, information because the, the poor populations are unrepresented in the polls, and on and on. Um, so a straw poll. A straw poll is where you ask individuals to call in to express their opinion on an issue or on a personality. And local television programs do that all the time. And they, um, they ask people to call in their opinion or they actually go out in the street and ask people out there. Um, or they'll use websites uh, to conduct straw polls. You see that all the time on websites. Um, and heck, American Idol is essentially a straw poll when you call in that stuff. A quota sample is based on the known population statistics and tries to avoid the problem of over or under sampling um, populations. So you take a proportionate um, sampling based on what you know as far as the demographics in that particular area. Most national surveys on the national level use stratified sampling based on um, census data, government census data, which is the most accurate they, that we have. So they'll select regions, countries, um, neighborhood blocks, and even households based on this this national data. So they so stratified like uh, you think about um, earth layers. You know, stratified. You want to you want to slice. Like if America is a cake, um, you obviously you can't sample the entire cake, but you want to take a slice of it um, and go through all the layers there. So um, Another way we do this stratification is by exit polls to predict election results. You know, you'll go into a certain um, polling area and ask people as they come out uh, who they voted for. But exit polls may fail to estimate the number of voters 
which will result uh, in an, uh, incorrect predictions. This happened in 2004 when early voting suggested Kerry was winning, and uh, he, he clearly was not. So methods. Um, surveys can be carried out in person, like, uh, like we just said, you know, these exit polls, usually in, uh, in person. They can be done, of course, by mail, um, and mail them back in a self-adjust stamped envelope. Of course, that's pretty old-fashioned nowadays. Um, they, are, uh, they can be done by phone. You see that a lot less because of the fact that um, a, lot of, a lot of households more and more are not even having landlines anymore, and they just have cell phones. Much, much more prevalent uh, and increasingly prevalent are online surveys. Danger, of course, being is that you're not you're getting repeated people on that, which would skew your results. Um, you, when you take these uh, samples and these polls. Uh, one uh, constant worry you should have is the issues of validity and reliability. Um, if the sample is not v valid or reliable, it can adversely affect uh, the, uh, the results. And um, a poll that is not valid or reliable uh, might have poor questions in it, um, a faulty ordering of the questions, inappropriate vocabulary um, some people don't understand the vocabulary um, questions that are vague and ambiguous questions that have built-in bias that direct um, people in a, or try, attempt to direct people in a certain direction and a limited response choices you know a or B well what if you want C you know so um, there's a, always going to be a margin of error in these polls um, it, to account for the accuracy, you know, the inaccuracy, human element of inaccuracy in um, in collecting this data. Generally speaking, if you've got a sampling of 1,500, your error um, margin is going to be plus or minus three, and um, that's sort of just taken into account. Some other problems in measuring public opinion, um, even if the samp even if the s the sample is right, and even if the 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 questions are correct, and and, and everything is good on the on the um, the polling end of it, the people who are trying to do the poll, there's a problem in the responses because we're human beings. Um, one of the one of the problems is the halo effect. Respondents to polling questions want to present themselves as good citizens, you know, and they, they want to have the best light. Well, we all do. But, um, you know, we ask questions to them, and, and they, uh, for example, you say, uh, they may say they vote when they don't, you know, and generally more people report that they voted in the recent election than the actual numbers show to be true. So we know this, this halo effect has to be in, in, in going on. And uh, people will tend to give you socially responsible or at least socially accepted or respected answers regarding some uh, some more personal or embarrassing sort of um, sort of questions, uh, issues such as obscenity, you know, um, issues such as prejudice and racism. Uh, they'll give you what they think you want to hear because they don't want to look racist, even if maybe they are racist or. Um, whether they're supporting pornography, I mean, it's not a lot of people wouldn't uh, be um, um, admitting that if they were. So another another problem in measuring public opinion is inconsistencies between surveys to surveys. Um, low or non-existent knowledge will lead to inconsistent responses, and um, Americans who uh, have have a wealth of education and information opportunities. I mean, it's just ridiculous how much opportunity you and other Americans have. Yet Americans consistently demonstrate very low levels of uh, of knowledge, and they're just poorly informed about opinion, and, and therefore their opinions are very poorly informed on many issues. Americans um, readily state their opinions. But these opinions will change with new information because their their opinions are not based on um, taking advantage of the educational and, and informational opportunities they have. They just throw their opinions out there. Therefore, their opinions do not have um, they're not very solid in their opinions, and, and they'll just go with whatever um, the current uh, the current news is going on about certain things.
So, um, push poles in the bandwagon, bandwagon effect, the last thing we're going to talk about. Survey questions may be designed um, purposely to move a respondent to a position rather than to simply measure attitudes. And this is just, this is just flat out bad political science here where you're, you're, you're trying to influence people in the way you ask the question, you know. So, um, and also then you also have the bandwagon effect, which is caused by, <clears throat> by a candidate being reported as the front runner, for example. Um, then future respondents will want to move to support the, the leader in the polls, so they'll, they'll pick that guy uh, or girl. So they want to get on the bandwagon. All these things are going to be problems in measuring public opinion. Okay, um, this was a long lecture, but I hope it was informative. I hope you found some use out of it, and, uh, and I hope you do well in all your endeavors, okay? Uh, remember rule four, make smart choices. I'll see you in class.